Hey. hey, Jack, how's it going? Ah, oh, it's not what I want. There's no way to turn it off. Let's turn it on.
Does anyone know if how to turn the front row of lights off? If that's possible. Uh, yeah. Um, yes, I think you use these for everything. Uh, okay. So, uh, so I'm to settings. Or uh, those are wrong. Uh, Maybe just, we can just put the blinds down at the back, and that'll solve the light problem. Uh, other rooms you can do the lights through the uh, yeah. but apparently maybe not <laughs> room combined no, but that means. Oh, that, uh, I think that's because there's another room uh, so. <coughs> oh there we go oh, that made it dark all over To another edition of the, the Logic Seminar Series. Um, we today have a treat because we've got someone from outside our group coming to give a guest lecture uh, from the mathematics department, Scott Morrison. Thanks, yeah. So uh, I've, uh, uh, I've been spending too much time playing with interactive theorem improvements lately. Um, I'm, a, I'm a complete amateur and I know there are people in the room who are, who are far from amateurs. Uh, but I encourage you, nevertheless, to speak up and tell me I'm doing stupid things and point me in the right direction and so on. Um, okay, so mostly uh, I want to motivate doing what I've been doing. And at the end of the talk, I want to show you uh, some things that um, I've been doing with students recently, uh, some of which I think are, are pretty fun. Um, <laughs> perhaps we should at some point get some of those students to, to talk as well, um, if I don't steal their thunder too much. Uh, okay. So, okay, why am I interested in interactive theorem proving? Um, so I'm a mathematician. I, um, I, I try and uh, spend time on my day job and actually prove theorems about tensor categories and topological field theories and strange things like this. Uh, and I'm interested in interactive theorem proving as a means to an end. I mean, I, I want tools that will help mathematicians be mathematicians. Uh, uh, and of course, if you say that at the moment, that we want to do interactive theorem proving so that we can be better mathematicians, the obvious objection is that's ridiculous. Interactive theorem proving makes it harder to do maths, not easier to do maths. And uh, so the answer to that is that we better start working on it. Um, I mean, it's always been pretty obvious to me, at least personally, that uh, in the circles of pure mathematicians that I work in, people use computers less than they ought to. Uh, Maybe this is just a sign that I use computers more than most of the people in the fields that I work in. Uh, mostly today, uh, that's about doing computations. That 
if you get good at, at teaching computers to do abstract mathematics on the computational side, you have access to examples and classifications and explorations that are just hard for human mathematicians to do, even in extremely abstract fields uh, that are not about combinatorics, that are not, a, that are not obviously, uh, where, where, where big computations are not obviously wrong. Okay, and theorem proving is a step beyond that, where uh, I think that everyone in the room who cares about theorem proving probably agrees that in the long run it's meant to help mathematicians and is actually, and, and is, is, is going to one day be good, but maybe we're not, we're not there yet. So everything here is sort of motivated by my attempt to be a scout for the world of pure mathematicians to come along to interpret theorem proofers and report back on the state of things. Uh, but I end up talking more to computer scientists than mathematicians now, anyway. Okay, so, okay, let's just dream for a little while at the very beginning. Uh, what, what do I want as a mathematician? Well, I want an Emacs mode, uh, where after I've typed slash begin proof, uh, I, I hit command meta klt, and the first couple of paragraphs of the proof appear, and then maybe a little comment saying, uh, but I'm stuck at this point. And then I read those paragraphs, and I say, oh, you're just meant to do induction on L and then on K. And then I hit some meta keys again, and it, uh, the computer writes some more. Uh, so, okay. The, so I want, I want interactive mathematics. I'm not really interested in, in purely automatic theorem proving. I don't, I don't feel purely automatic theorem proving is, is ever, or is ever likely to be particularly relevant to human mathematicians. Who knows? Um, so yeah, I'm very, I care very much about the interactive style, and I'd like to get it as close as possible to, to being like the experience of talking to other humans. Obviously, it's very, very far from that at the moment, and the dream of working in natural language is far away, although, of course, people, people are working on it or are working on related things. Uh, uh, but the, the weaker version of that is just that uh, I really want to avoid ever writing in, things in an interactive theorem proof that are very far away from the level at which you would talk to another human. I don't care for now about syntax and all that stuff, but I don't want to have to write boring details that I'd never say to another human. Okay, and of course, we want to dream in the future of having beautifully wonderful automation uh, that does two things. Uh, one, it's got sort of finishing style tactics that just get rid of everything that humans wouldn't want to have to think about because they know they can follow and that they knows and get there. Uh, but at the same time, we want to have interactive tactics whose purpose is not to necessarily to finish the goal, but to work on the goal and return a new goal that is still comprehensible to humans so the humans can pick up on it. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, okay, it's important to have, have both of these things. Now, uh, something I've been realizing more and more as I try and do any mathematics in an exactly the same prover is that it's very important that uh, the system isn't merely for writing mathematics. Uh, the, the human using the system needs to be able to extend it in every, in every direction. Uh, and so it's important that not only can you extend the library of mathematics that an interactive theorem proof knows about, you need to be able to extend a lot of the tooling. So I mentioned parsing there, but it's extremely important uh, that the end user can actually write automation. The end user can write new tactics that help you write proofs. Uh, and I think that this is the thing <coughs> that, uh, that, that I, I'm sort of excited about and interested in at the moment. I think historically there's been a bit of a divide. If you want to write automation in a theorem prover, you more or less need to be one of the system developers, and it's kind of unlikely that as an end user you're going to be doing that. Uh, and I think that's changing, and I think that's great. Uh, and uh, I want to emphasize the importance of, of teaching mathematicians how to write automation, not, uh, not just telling them they can do maths. Uh, and I'll try and I'll give some examples, some concrete examples of that in the maths that I've been doing later. Okay. Uh, any questions about the dreams? They're all good dreams, aren't they? Everyone agrees these are worthwhile things to aim for. Uh, okay, what do we have next? Uh, okay, I've, I've mostly been working in Lean, which is uh, a newish interactive theorem prover. Uh, so let me just briefly say a few things about it. Um, it's, it's in some ways very similar to Coq. The logical, the logical underpinnings are, are almost identical. The way they handle universes is slightly different. Um, the way they, they handle uh, more interesting uh, recursion is, is a bit different, but, uh, but fundamentally they're very similar. And fundamentally, I don't really care about those logical underpinnings. Uh, okay. uh, a really cool thing about Lean, which differentiates it from everything else available, I think, 
is that all of the metaprogramming happens in the same language as, as in itself. There's no need to learn a separate language. Like in Coq, there's no need to learn LTAC or MTAC or whatever the other ones are. Um, you're just writing more lead. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how that happens in practice a little bit later. Uh, it's mostly being developed at Microsoft Research and, and Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon. Uh, there are, are, interestingly, a bunch of, well, not a bunch, a small, small bunch of pure mathematicians who are actively working on, on Lean today as well, which I think is kind of fun. Um, it's, it's a new language, so everything about it is work in progress. The maths library is not, it's not that extensive. Uh, the automation is broken and horrible compared to what you're used to in, in Cock and Isabel and everywhere else. Um, all of the tooling is, is getting there, but there are lots of things you, you might miss out on. And code generation at the moment, like producing executables from constructive mathematics, uh, I think just doesn't work at the moment. But all of those things are, are, are on the horizon very soon. Uh, and a particular big caveat about everything I say today is that they've stopped working on Lean 3 and told everyone that it's a waste of time to invest any effort in Lean 3 because everything's going to change in Lean 4 in a couple of months. Uh, but the mathematicians are just pressing on regardless and working in Lean 3. We've been warned that uh, it, might all, it might all break. Um, uh, yeah, let me, let me just very briefly say it. One of the big things that Lean 4 will do is this will be great. There will be a, a just-in-time compiler to LLVM something, something, something. Uh, and in particular, that will mean that a huge amount of the automation that is currently written in the giant, crazy, complicated C++ part of Lean will be kicked out of the C++ part of Lean and be written purely in Lean, just in the better programming world. But it will be, the promise is that it will be really fast. And we'll see. Um, OK, so just a warning that about, about that. It's a language very much in flux. OK, so as I said, Lean is all uh, in, in uh, independent type theory, very similar to, to, to Koch. Uh, and I think that this is actually really appealing to many mathematicians, at least the mathematicians that I like to hang out with. Um, I think the, the maybe, I mean, I, I, I don't want to make strong claims here, but I feel like if you look at the sort of analysis algebra split, the analysts are going to like, uh, kind of, uh, well, non-dependent type theories, and the algebraists are going to like dependent type theorists a bit more, but uh, that might just be prejudices. Um, I mean, here are just some random examples from, from, from I don't know, category theory, maybe algebraic geometry, where you're, uh, where these are actual bits of lean code, where you're writing down, I don't know, pre-sheafs and maps between pre-sheaves. And at least modulo the syntax, uh, it's exactly what a, a, a human would write, almost nothing more. Uh, What's going on in pre sheaf You've got x, a topological space, and you've got o, a functor from the open sets to some other target category c. In a morphism of pre sheaf you've got a map f from the space that's underlying x and the space underlying p. And that arrow there is magically being interpreted as uh, a morphism in the category of topological spaces. Uh, and so that's automatically continuous without us having said anything there. And similarly, uh, the other data of a map of pre sheaf is some natural transformation between that functor and this composition of functors and uh, the dependent type theory, let's just say that, all very tersely. Um, the thing that really convinces mathematicians that they, they like dependent type theory is when you tell them that three is a topology on two if they don't believe in dependent type theory. Does everyone know this one already? Okay, so okay. the ZFC is just stupid and idiotic. Um, I, I say this as the sort of expert who is, I think has never even seen the axioms of ZFC written on a piece of paper let alone am able to tell them to you, but it's clearly stupid because uh, the standard encoding of, of natural numbers as sets, when you believe everything is a set, goes something like this. Okay, and, and you all know what comes next. And now this sentence is both syntactically correct, three could be a topology on two in the sense that it is a collection of subsets of, of two. And it's even true. Like, it actually satisfies all the axioms for a topology. It's like closed under intersections and unions, the empty set is there, the whole set is there, yada, yada, yada. Okay? But that's stupid. Okay? Two and three are natural numbers. One can't be a topology on, on the other. And, uh, and mathematicians always carry the types around in their heads to begin with. And so they like dependent type theory. Okay, great. Um, 
I'm sort of uncertain at this point um, whether I should. Um, uh, I have some things I'm going to show you later, but I could at this point just show you a bit of, of lean. Let's do that. Okay. Uh, how do I do that? There's a copy of lean. Okay, so we always we we nearly always use. Let me increase the font size a whole lot. Is that legible? Yep. So we nearly always work in, in VS Code, which is a nice editor. There's a nice Emacs mode if you want to. Um, it's all pretty easy uh, to, uh, to install these days. Ha ha. Um, it's, got, it's got an awful lot better. Um, and in fact, there are some nice tutorials that let you do it in a couple of minutes now. OK, so let's prove something. We'll just pretend we've got a copy of Lean up and running already. So let's prove they're infinitely primes. Uh, infinitude of primes. So lots of ways you can say that. Uh, so for every natural number, uh, there exists um, a p greater than or equal to n such that p is prime. And Lean already complains to us. The red squiggly lines are complaining. It says it doesn't know what prime is. So let's just import something uh, that tells it what prime numbers are. And for convenience, open the namespace for natural numbers so we can refer to things more easily. It's still complaining because, of course, we haven't written the proof. So, of course, in Lean, like in other places, you can either work in term mode or in tactic mode. Uh, being a mathematician, I always work in tactic mode uh, because life is easier. And so we stop and think about the mathematics for just a second. What are you meant to do? You take n factorial plus 1. You pick a prime factor of n factorial plus 1, and you prove that that does the job. OK, so let's see that. Uh, so let m be fact n plus 1. I just, I mean, we could easily set things up so that you could write n exclamation mark if you wanted to. That's not out of the box. Uh, and then let p be, I could show you how to look this up, but for now let me just uh, save some time by telling you that I happen to know that the, the function in the library for taking the minimum prime factor of a number is called minfac. OK, so what am I meant to do at this point? Uh, let's turn on the, the display that shows the, the goals. And this is very familiar to anyone who's used COC uh, at this point. Uh, it shows us the hypotheses and the, and the goal. And so we've got our P, so we say, well, that's the P we want. Exists I is, I guess, short for instantiate existential or something silly like that. Uh, and you can see that, the, of course, the goal has changed. Uh, before that, we said there exists P such that blah, blah, blah. And after that, we just have to say the blah, blah, blah. So we've got two goals. We need to show p is bigger than n, or is at least n, and p is prime. And so one thing we might do is just call split, which will actually turn that into two separate goals. However, I happen to know that in both branches of this proof, we need to know the fact that p is prime. So let's just prove, prove that p is prime ahead of time. So we'll write have pp saying p is prime. Okay, And that gives us a new goal uh, that p is prime, and then we've got the rest of it. And let's just say sorry at that point, because we don't feel like doing that. Uh, and so now in the split, uh, since we've got two goals, just to make things readable, let's use curly braces, which lets us focus on the first goal. Uh, and I guess the second goal is easy now by assumption, because we, we'd already earlier proved that p was prime. So here we've just got to deal with the fact that p is at least n. This one takes a little bit of work. Well, I mean, there's a little bit more maths in here, so we've got to think about how to do it. Uh, the point is that P necessarily, well, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, before you start doing any, anything with numbers, you realize you meant to prove this by contradiction. You meant to, you meant to uh, write by contradiction. Okay. And that gives us a somewhat silly hypothesis. It is not the case that P is greater than or equal to N. Uh, and so we hope that simp at A clears that up. And sure enough, it turns that into the hypothesis. P is less than N. Okay, now we can do some maths. So... Uh, what are you meant to do? You're meant to say that since p is less than n, uh, p divides n factorial. Okay, so let's have that. Have h1, oops, 1, uh, p divides fact n. And that should be easy, so let's just say sorry for now. Uh, and then have 2. The other thing is that p divides m, and that should also be easy, because we picked p as a as the minimum factor of m. So hopefully we can get that pretty easily. And then we notice that m and n factorial just differ by 1. 
So it should be pretty easy to prove that p divides 1. And now, uh, again, things should be pretty easy because we've got that p is prime and p divides 1. And that sounds like rubbish. OK. OK, so the proof is, is all done except for the easy bits. So we've written sorry, and Lean tells us, uh-oh, that declaration uses sorry. So you're welcome to proceed onwards, but that error message or that warning will propagate through every file that imports this one. OK, so that's good. Why don't we actually finish off what we're doing? Um, I'm not going to, I could, we could prove those bits by hand, um, but let's just use a tiny bit of automation. Uh, backwards reasoning is like a, a very primitive version of auto in Isabel, um, and it's going, to, it's going to do the job for us, hopefully. So we just write, well, let's put curly braces so it's easy to see what the goal is before and after. So we write back. And the goal beforehand was proving that P was prime. And the goal afterwards is proving that M is not equal 1. So it did something. I wonder how it did that. Uh, we can ask it what it did. Uh, uh, the hash really should be a question mark, but I was fighting with the parser. Um, I'm failing. So that tells us that that, that that invocation of back realized it was a good idea to apply the, the lemma min fact prime, which just asserts that the minimum factor of something, the minimum prime factor of something really is a prime. But of course, it had a side condition that as a human mathematician, I never would have noticed that uh, you need to pay attention to the fact that m might, 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 be, might be equal to 1. And so uh, just, like, um, just like auto, you can give back some hints about extra lemmas to try and do backwards reasoning with. Uh, the way that you should show that m is not equal to 1 here is just show that m is bigger than 1 which we're going to get pretty easily from facts about factorial. So we just give it a hint here that it's allowed to use not equal of greater than. Oh, and back finished the job. It says that it says there was nothing else to do. Uh, and again, we can put the hash there to see what it did. And since it's actually finishing this goal, rather than a print telling us that a call to apply will work, it's saying that a call to exact will work. It's just giving us the exact term that would have worked there. And if we want to, if we, if we, if we want to, we could copy and paste that uh, into the proof there. Uh, but that would be needlessly obfuscatory. OK, so we've got that. And we're just going to con continue in basically the same way here and have backwards reasoning hopefully deal with everything for us. Uh, I guess I should put braces around things so I can tell whether it actually finished the goal or not. Uh, Uh, so that's actually doing pretty well. There was one place where it failed. So let's look at what it was trying to do. This is the one where... Um, what's the goal? We know that... Oh, sorry, I've screwed up somewhere. Okay, this didn't have enough parentheses. Yeah, this one didn't succeed either. Okay, so proving that P divides factorial N. Uh, we're left still with two goals. We need to prove that p is at least 0 and p is less than or equal to n. Um, so we need to give back some hints. And I probably just have forgotten what hints I meant to give it here. So let me just, let me just be lazy, because this is taking a little bit longer than I wanted. Um, I guess we could tell it that all prime numbers are positive and that it's allowed to prove that something is less than or equal using the fact that it's strictly less than. Okay. And then for this one, we need some relatively obscure fact. Okay. Oops. Right. So this is some lemma that says, what if k divides m, k divides n, then k divides m plus n. And I guess that last implication there was an if and a bit back money just to work all that out how to use that. And then this last back is still not, is not working. So what's the point? Uh, oh, I guess we need to write, um, we need to tell it that primes don't divide one. So this is, I mean, as I said, this is, back is still a very primitive thing. It's not really attempting to go and, uh, and, and search much of the library for things. It does a, it does a few basic things, but it's not. OK. So that's an example. We proved something, uh, and it, it was 
pretty close to what humans would have written. In fact, it worked a little bit better. We would have in fact written nothing that a human would have written, wouldn't have written. I guess it doesn't make that sense. A human would have preferred to leave out. Okay. So, yep. What, if anything, is the ramifications of using proof by contradiction in a framework that's oh, based on we're, constructors? We're, 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 we're doing mathematics here. Um, we, uh, the axiom of choice is welcome, the law of the excluded middle is welcome. Uh, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> so, okay. what's, so, what's happening underneath the hood is yeah, okay. So, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, tension there? Um, uh, as I said, we're doing mathematics here. <laughs> the axiom of choice and the law of the excluded middle are built in at, at um, day zero. I mean, no, okay, so yes. Um, uh, you're welcome to use lean to work in, in, in slightly slightly more general logics than the one mathematicians use. Um, they're, um, uh, uh, you probably can do something like write, I don't even, I, you can, I never do this, but you can probably write something like print axioms, infinitude of primes, and it might tell us, oh yeah, it says it used, it used classical choice there. So you can work out after the fact if, if you used anything you didn't want to use, but uh, um, I mean, probably. But uh, I mean, I'm saying this partly as a joke to make a point. But I'm a mathematician; I couldn't care less. <laughs> that's not part of mathematics to worry about questions like that. That's that's logic, which is fine. You guys are, you are a separate a separate group of people in another department. Okay, but anyway, I, obviously I'm joking, and um, and. Um, but my question is really, does, okay. does working in a non-constructive way cause you problems? Uh, if you want to extract code, of course, it, it, it causes problems. Um, but otherwise, otherwise, I, I don't, I've never seen any sign of it causing a problem. The area that you might be able to construct groups that can't be checked. Yeah, uh, okay. I, 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 I'm not aware of uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, saying this to a bunch of logicians is obviously, uh, it, it's sort of, it, it's a bit silly, but I think this is actually an important point when I, when I want to explain that interactive theorem proving might one day be relevant to mathematicians. I think it's extremely important to emphasize that you don't have to think about any of that stuff. You're not compelled to work constructively or intuitionistically or anything like that. No one's, no one's, no one's even encouraging you to do so, <laughs> to, to use a system like this. Okay. Uh, where does that leave us? Um, any other questions about using lean, that proof? So you don't have to inform what axioms you want to infer or exclude? Um, because you know where the code is. Yeah, so. Um, the, I mean, you do have control. In the sense that you can go through and print axioms of things, uh, and uh, if you—I mean—if you're writing all your proofs by hand without using tactics, then of course you'll notice at the point at which you invoke the axiom of choice, tactics might be doing it for you, and, and they will do so pretty happily. So, uh, I think you can, although again, making my point about not caring, I have no idea how to do it. I think you, there is a way of setting, telling lean to generate error messages on certain axioms. So you could cause it to the compiler to, to, to refuse. <laughs> Not my problem. OK. Um, OK. Let's uh, proceed on. Um, so. Uh, the 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 ad for lean from the developers of lean and I, and I think I, I pretty much believe it is that it really makes it significantly easier to write new new tactics so it's still way too cumbersome to write mathematics in lean uh, and I think the the but the really interesting thing is that as you're developing some particular corner of mathematics if you go off and do some category theory you go off and do some different geometry as a mathematician, you can start writing baby tactics that help you as you as you develop the mathematics. So uh, all of the metaprogramming 
happens just in lean code itself. There are no separate files, there's no separate syntax, there's no separate language. Uh, but everything happens prefixed with this, this meta keyword. And uh, this has a few effects. So one, any function you write that does not have the meta keyword cannot call any code that does use the meta keyword. So it's a one-way wall that you, you, you can't get through. Uh, and so when you do actual mathematics, you don't want to have the meta keyword on it. Uh, and being, in, being inside a meta definition gives you access to a bunch of things. First of all, it gives you access to unbounded recursion without having to give any proofs about how your recursion works, which is useful for doing actual programming. Uh, the second thing is that it gives you access to a whole lot of uh, constants defined in lean, or with the meta keyword, which uh, give you access both to the tactic state, the thing that's managing the current goals and hypotheses and so on, and gives you access to uh, reflected versions of expressions in the, in the lean language. So you can pull apart expressions and build expressions and so on. Now, while of course you can't call meta functions uh, in a function that you're writing, in a begin end block where you're using tactic mode, you're of course very welcome to call meta functions that write part of your proof for you. And, and that's why uh, the division into meta and not meta is a, is a reasonable thing to do. Okay, so I think uh, unless we get into it later, I'm not gonna go super far into, into these two points. Um, there is a very nice paper by um, Leonardo de Moura and the other developers of Lean called, I think, um, Meta Programming for Formal Verification, which maybe some of you have seen before. It's, it's very nicely written and, and a very easy read uh, that describes these two points in great detail. Uh, so you, the, the very brief version is, is you, well, you do monadic programming with lots of, lots of do blocks to interact uh, with this uh, tactic uh, monad that, uh, that lets you manage goals and hypotheses and so on in a very flexible way that at first is a bit disconcerting. You're welcome in the tactic monad to just uh, throw out the goals and put in a bunch of new goals. And it feels a little scary, but uh, I mean, it's keeping track of things for you. Um, and similarly, there's a, a very nice inductive type for called expression, which reflects lean expressions, that you can either play with by hand, just talking about as an inductive type. And it's actually a little bit sad that extra is labeled meta in lean. They probably could have, with a little bit of work, got away with not having expression be meta. So you can prove things about the things you, you were doing with, with extra. And it's possible that that'll happen in future versions. But a whole lot of the associated things to do with expression have to be meta because they're, they're doing things like unifying two expressions, which obviously is not something that you want to, that, that you want to have to prove things about or, or you want to be able to use in writing, in writing terms. Uh, but besides using ex, extra as an inductive type in all the usual ways, the language has uh, a very nice pattern matching syntax, so you can quickly decompose expression objects, basically just by writing lean expressions uh, with, uh, with uh, what is it, double percent symbols at, at places to extract sub-expressions the way you want, and anti-quotations, which are nice tools for quickly building expressions, basically by writing raw lean expressions, but again, uh, um, with, uh, with appropriate backticks and parentheses and percent signs in the right places to, to substitute and, 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 uh, and Combine things. Yeah, yeah. So it's, I mean, it's the exact same language. The, so you can write functions that use the expression and then combine them with another function. So the implication in a sense that you can't write things that. Well, so well, where, where did the hundred come from? Well, well, I'm just making up an arbitrary thing to write. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah sure. Um, so you write them in a percentage, you write something Yeah, yep, yep. So the, it, it really is exactly, and, and a very nice feature of this is that as you're writing tactics uh, that are sort of domain specific for some particular corner of mathematics, the, the library that you're writing simultaneously becomes available as you, as you step along. And, and it's often extremely useful to, to actually do that in the tactic language, use theorems that, or constructions from them. So, the natural question is if you're a function programming perspective, you want to do that. Is that really the right function programming language to use? Because Google, you write Haskell or OpenAI, yeah. doesn't have that feature for deep learning. It seems to be different for deep learning. It seems to be more sort of got into it. And my suspicion is that because they're different, they're too hard to use in a different introduction language, and it's simplified for 
over here. Hmm. Um, but mathematicians and logicians love them, right? And so they will try to sell them to people who are important. Yeah. But, uh, no, no, no. I mean, okay. So it's certainly true that um, maybe um, I think Keely can, can chime in on, on this one. Um, it's certainly true that when you're writing tactics and when you're not really heavily using the dependent type theory, um, I mean, it's nice to define your, I mean, define little inductive types that, so that you, instead of having to use booleans and little flags for things and so on, but uh, I, I feel like, uh, well, actually, no, maybe, maybe that's not so true. I mean, we, in the example that I'll show you at the end, something that, that Keeley's been doing, where we're doing big graph searches and keeping track of a big complicated sort of relationship between graphs of expressions and rewrites and so on, we're using some dependent type theory just in, in setting up the data structures there. I don't, I don't think it's, I think that the fact that the dependent types are available in the metaprogramming side is not really the, the important bit. It's just that it's the same language and so the friction that the, the sort of impedance mismatch is as small as possible, I think is more significant. One awkward, horrible thing about the metaprogramming side is that um, you're, for some crazy reason, uh, you're basically stuck in the bottom universe level, and like, it, and it gets awkward. You actually have to fight universe levels in the in the metaprogramming framework sometimes, uh, for reasons I don't quite understand. Is, is that okay? Then is that okay? Okay. Uh, okay. So. I want to sort of demonstrate a little bit of this. So I want to show you some mathematics uh, and, and then some automation specific to that corner of mathematics. Uh, so category theory has been my, my playground for a lot of the time I've been in Lean. And the goal has always been to develop category theory refusing to write more than a human would write. Uh, and if you, I don't know if I can zoom in in this one. Okay, yeah. Okay, is that, oh. It was much easier when I was going to use my iPad. So here are some, some sample libraries of, from other people in various languages. I think these first two are maybe both in, they look like they're both in Coq. Yeah, um, various, various libraries uh, where they're describing the Yoneda functor and, uh, and proving lemmas about it. And over here, there's some fragment of, of I think, something in Isabel describing the Yoneda functor. And you can look all around and find people have done this a million times over in greatly varying lengths. Uh, I think, actually, these two I found here in, in Coq, one from Unimath, which is the homotopy type theory library uh, in Coq, or a homotopy type theory library, and one by Adam Shilpachli-Hala and Jason Gross and David Spivak is another one. These are actually relatively short. I mean, it only takes a couple of pages to set up the Yoneda functor and prove the basic facts about it. I managed to find some old developments in Isabel of the Yoneda lemma that, that extended for many tens of pages, uh, which is a little alarming. Um, uh, okay, so fine. Uh, so what do we have? Uh, so here's in, I don't know, that's what, 20 lines after you've finished with the import statements is the entire development of the Yoneda lemma uh, from the definition, which is a, a one-liner, in fact, only about 12 characters after the colon equals, where you can find plenty of examples of this in the literature, where that first one line passes over several pages. Uh, uh, then the remainder is setting up, defining the Yoneda evaluation of the Yoneda pairing, and then proving the Yoneda lemma, which says the Yoneda pairing and the Yoneda evaluation are naturally isomorphic. And then almost nothing on this page that, is, that doesn't need to be said, that is, you wouldn't say even if you're talking to a human. The conspicuous parts that, don't, that it's a pity you need to say at the moment and you don't need to are these two simple limits, you made a pairing map and you made your evaluation map down, which are basically just saying if you take one of these functions like you made a pairing and you actually sort of fully apply it out to all its arguments, then it does what it's meant to do. And we, we need that simple limit so that the automation that's running in this proof here is willing to unfold that definition at the right point. Um, this is something that future automation will hopefully get rid of. I think someone was telling me this recently that lean is missing 
a good analog of, of CBV in Coq, the call by value tactic, and a clever version of that. You probably let you omit those two simple elements, after which you're really at the absolute bare minimum that a human would ever say. This proof of the innate dilemma says absolutely nothing except this is the map that way, this is the map, this is the map one way, this line is the map the other way, and all the facts that everything inside is factorial and natural, of which there are quite a few such checks there, and these maps are universes, is all just being taken care of. Um, let me just show you sort of in lean the sort of four different iterations as you improve the automation of just that very first line. So here we've got unit zero, unit one, unit two, and unit three. These are just defining the functor. So should I say what the unit lemma is? Know what that is? I don't know. No. Okay, okay. Let's. Um, so I mean, we can just we can almost just read this line uh, if I can find a piece of chalk. Uh, blue. Okay. So you need a uh, is a functor uh, from any category C to uh, the category of functors from C opposite the set, except we're doing path theory today, so we have path instead of set. And a mathematician would just say, well, all this does is take some object here, okay, and we're meant to produce a functor, and, and this functor is just the whole functor. This says that the, uh, the functor that x gets sent to is the functor that takes an object y in C opposite and produces a home space, home sub C, where you go y to x. Okay? And home sub C is a set or a type of set. Okay? And then if you think about it, to each x you've associated some functor. To a map between x's, you then get an actual transformation between the corresponding functors. And similarly here, for a map between the y's, you get a map between these home sets by precomposition by the map be between the y's. Uh, and so in that, because there were levels here and levels here, and I needed to check all those things were natural and factorial and so on, there are actually quite a few checks going on. And that's what's going on in this first unit of zero. We say that once you plug in x and once you plug in y, the set is just y maps to x. And that arrow is being interpreted as homes in the category. And then there are all these obligations checking that that, that that assignment is accurate. So this is all saying, oh, and this, is, this line is then saying what happens as you change y by homomorphism, how you get a map between these guys. These next couple of lines are checking that, that that whole gadget is functorial with respect to y. Then these lines are saying what happens if you have a morphism from x to x prime, how you get a natural transformation from that functor to that functor. And then finally, these lines are checking that everything is actually uh, functorial in X. Okay, so it's boring, uh, and no mathematician would write more than that. So we then have a little bit more, uh, some very easy automation here, which basically just uses some tools that, that just say, uh, prove things by going down into components and checking things component-wise in some sense, and using simplification whenever, you, whenever, you, whenever simplifying works. And it's not quite there. You do need to say a few things. Uh, Unit 2 uh, is really good. It's, there's no proof obligations in there. We're only constructing the data of what all the maps do. And so here we're managing to sort of automatically do some rewrites along earlier axioms that uh, we have available. And then this is the one that, uh, that is really a bit surprising. And it, what's going on from here to here is if we've written a tactic that implements the mathematician's observation that once you know what this functor is doing on a pair of objects x and y, there's only one possible thing you can write down for all the other levels because they're just things built out of the tool, the only tools you have available, which are compositions and identity morphisms. Given there's only one formula you can write down, you might as well write it down. And that's what's going on under the hood of this definition. So we just write down the mathematician's definition. First of all, one tactic, the tactic is actually called follow your nose. Uh, and then there's another tactic that's achieving this step, which does automatic rewriting. And then there's another tactic that does that step, which handles just prove things by blasting everything to smithereens and doing things component wise. Is that embodied in this slash lambda? Yeah, so the, the slash lambda, well, so the slash lambda there is actually just notation. Uh, you, can do, you can define yourself new notation. And really, all the, uh, let me just show you what slash lambda does. Um, uh, so slash lambda 
is this line here. So it sets up notation for lambda as a binder with something before and after a comma. And it essentially just says replace, uh, replace what you see with, uh, with this, um, which is uh, build an instance of a functor where the map on objects is the f, that is the thing that came after the comma, and then use the tactic obviously to build the map. And a moment earlier, we wrote attribute tidy construct morphism, which just, there's some tactic we wrote here, construct morphism, which is the thing that's following your nose and just trying to do things using composition identities. And this attribute here just tacks in construct morphism to a big pool of tactics that, that this tactic obviously is using. That, uh, uh, and, and again, this is all, like these lines are all kind of in user space, there's no, no nothing scary going on. And you can actually see a moment earlier, maybe we could read this if we want to, but I, no, I want the last 10 minutes to tell you about something else. Um, here's an example of, of a meta, ta a tactic that we're, we're writing in lean, where there's a little do block which interacts with the tactic state. It's just part of the code in amongst the actual maths. Okay, so that's fun. Uh, I mean, this example I've shown you here of the innate dilemma is obviously a carefully chosen example where things work out as well as you possibly might hope. It's not always like that. Uh, I mean, uh, it's a bit misrepresentative, but certainly things like that have been the goal. So what I want to show you um, to end is a little bit more about how that works. So I showed you a little bit about, um, oh, sort of there was this follow your nose tactic that, that built maps for us. And then there were two steps there. There was the thing that sort of, there was this obviously tactic which just sort of broke things into components and, and worked. Uh, and in some sense, that's an, that's an approximation of the algorithm described in this paper by Ganesha Lingham and Gowers uh, a few years ago. I think the title is, I can't remember the title, but human style automation is somewhere in there, where they were very focused on writing automation that preserved human readability of the final goals uh, that was extremely conservative in the sense that it didn't do any backtracking search to solve problems. It only did things if it was sure it was the right step. Unfortunately, everything they did was in glorious isolation of their own custom-built theorem prover that you, they didn't even release. So it was a bit unhelpful for the rest of us. Um, but the obviously tactic that I mentioned there is an approximation of that that now exists in Lean. The second part is this tactic for automatically doing rewriting. Uh, and this is, this is a cute trick. It's, it's all written in lean, modulo a little epsilon. Um, and it, uh, it, well, yeah, okay. So it does rewriting of expressions and it uses a little bit of machine learning to do so. And this is a uh, work in progress uh, with Kili Hoek, who's actually right there in the audience, uh, who's an undergrad in the maths department at the moment. So rewrite search is some tactic we wrote in lean. It proves equational goals, things of the form A equals B just by rewriting sub-expressions uh, using some specified set of lemmas. Uh, Keeley has been experimenting actually with also, also going out and discovering lemmas that are helpful. Uh, now, in all the instances where we want to use rewrite search, actually searching the whole graph of possible rewrites starting from A and starting from B would be ridiculous. You, the, the, the graph would, would grow very, very fast. And so we need some heuristic to guide the search. And the basic version of rewrite search uses a very, very simple thing which is just edit distance minimizing. So uh, what does that mean? Well, we search out from both sides of the goal at the same time. And all that we do is we pretty print the expression on one side of the equation or the other. We turn it into an actual string of text. Uh, and then we calculate the edit distance between the two sides, the number of characters you need to insert or delete or modify. We don't actually do it character-wise. We do it token-wise. So it doesn't matter what variable names are and so on. And then as we search out from A and B, we just keep a track of a list of interesting pairs, that is something connected to A and something connected with B, and we keep track of the pairs that have the smallest edit distance at the moment. And at each step, we just take the most interesting pair, that is the pair with the smallest edit distance, and try rewriting one side or the other using the available lemmas and see if we can shrink the distance. If we do shrink the distance, we go onto there. If we don't, then maybe we step back out and, and search earlier interesting pairs. Now, this is pretty dumb. Uh, it's very general purpose because it doesn't look at the mathematics at all. It just looks at the strings. Um, that's both both good and bad. Yeah. 
sure the inconsistency is not quite so. Yeah, so, I, I, the, okay. Um, yeah, the, um, mostly because I didn't want to have to think about at a distance between trees. Uh, <laughs> uh, Secondly, because you would, uh, because we're doing the pendant time theory, every expression you look at has this whole hidden stack of implicit arguments sitting everywhere else. You would have to make sure you didn't look at those, which is fine. I mean, the pretty printer's not looking at those either, so it's not really losing anything. So it would be easy to write the code but ignore those in a, in a good manner. But yeah, mostly because I didn't want to think about the meaning of edited between trees. Uh, and mostly because the dumb version works. <laughs> uh, gets you a fair way. So the other thing is that if you just read, if the golden thing you call it here, right, you simply say less than equal to some thing, then you, you leave the code to simplify the code too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if you've got any relation that's reflexive, I guess you can you can try it. Uh, well, oh, but you mean rewrite along inequalities as well? Oh, well, no, I have to do I mean, that. That would be another. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you want to rewrite along inequalities, you have to make sure you have appropriate congruence lemmas. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, no, we've just, just uh, I think, does it, it works on if and only if statements as well as equalities. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, okay, so let me quickly show you this in action, hopefully. Uh, here we go. So what are we doing in this file? We are talking about equivalences of categories. And there's a lovely lemma about equivalences of categories that you've got a functor between categories that's an equivalence. So that means whatever it means. Uh, the theorem says that functor is, is, is uh, fully faithful and essentially surjective. A whole bunch of words. And at some point, we're proving the limit that equivalence is full. And so here, we just write what we need to write. Uh, um, okay, so uh, what would we do? So saying that a functor is full just means that Basically, every morphism has a pre-image. We write down an explicit formula for the, for the, for the pre-image here. Uh, and then, to give the proof, we say, oh, you let's use the fact that you've already proved that the inverse functor is an injection, which is whatever mathematician agrees with the first step. And then you just hand it over to the packets to, uh, to run. Uh, the, the sequence tidy and then rewrite search would usually be done just by obviously, and we could even omit it. Uh, but I wanted to expand them out so that I can fit all of the arguments here. But what's going on? Ah, here we go. Okay. So there's A and B, the two expressions that it's trying to prove are equal. Let's actually look what they are. Uh, oh, it's not going to show us because it's still thinking. Okay. It's got some giant mess of things that it's trying to prove are equal. And this used to run fast, but because I'm trying to do a demo in front of real live human beings, Last night, or a couple of days ago, it decided to start running 10 times slower than it used to run, and I can't work out why. Um, so it's sitting there thinking, oh, and it starts going, okay. Um, I have seen this whole thing run in a couple of seconds. Kili is like sitting here also upset that it's running slowly. Um, yeah. Imagine this whole thing happening here, happening in two seconds, okay? <laughs> we'll have that working for you. Um, uh, it's just too slow, isn't it? So, yeah, ask questions yes, while we watch. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, it's effectively going to be each of those total blocks and be one inch block because it's not going to come out of the blocks. Exactly, yeah. So it's actually deciding, having to compare, it's got some algorithm deciding whether you might have left inside all the blocks inside. Really? <laughs> or does it do both? Uh, Yeah, certainly in many examples that does happen. This one it actually doesn't. This one will run the whole time working on the purple side. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think we're. Yeah. It, it may be, I mean, the rewrites often actually only work one way. Like the rewrite, it can't see that it's possible to imply some rewrite backwards. So sometimes you have to come in from one side. 
it may just be that this is always happening. It's tried that green verdict, couldn't get anywhere from it, and we're going to have to drop into it. Okay. Um, Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And so that's why there needs to be a meaningful heuristic to, to constrain the search so we don't go off into stupid, into stupid side -track. And in a version of this that ran fast, you can run this until the two vertices connect and then leave it running a while longer, just tell it keep searching, and you see that this graph has thousands and thousands of vertices. The valence here is typically up to like 15 or 20. Like we're not even certain we want to be using the valence. If you keep going, the, it's, a, it's a very large graph that it's working on. Um, let me uh, drag things around if you feel like it to waste some time while our broken algorithm does whatever so broken thing it's doing. No, the, the edit distance is not reflected. I mean, this is just a graph. It's just a, every, every interview here is just a string. Okay, so, uh, okay, I better say one or two things while that goes, um, because it's very sad. It's pretty close now. Uh, um, but yeah, imagine that taking a few seconds instead. Okay, uh, so there's lots of generalizations that we could make of this algorithm. Uh, at the moment, we just work greedily. That is, we find the pair that have the closest, that are the closest apart at the moment. We probably should be using a star search of graphs, which is basically just you sum the distance from the origin to one side of your pair, across to the other guy in the pair, and back to the origin. And that'll, that discourages going off in stupid directions. Uh, and it's, it's worth trying, but we haven't really tried it yet. The other thing that we have tried is uh, modifying the edit distance as we work. So at the moment, it's just every token is equal. If you change a token or insert or delete it, it all costs one. But what you can do is look at the tokens that appear and run a classifier on them. And what you might discover is that some tokens conspicuously appear on the left-hand side, and some appear conspicuously on the right-hand side, but not the other way around. And then you should consider that those tokens are important, because any lemma that actually changes them is actually making significant progress from one side to the other. And uh, so Keeley has, has implemented a few versions of this, either using a very simple center of mass classifier, the hyperplane between the centers of mass of the two vectors, and that's using Keeley and Lean, or uh, a very tiny modified version of Lean you can hook up to the SPM and actually run a proper classifier on it. And maybe all that I'll say about all those, oh, yay, look at that. There's a pink path that says I won. I finally found a proof uh, getting you from, from A to B. Uh, I think from memory that one's 13 rewrites long. Uh, I worked this out at some point. I tried to write one by hand, actually thinking rather than using this level of idiocy. And it was still pretty long. I think there were like seven or eight steps when I was doing it by hand. So it's not an optimal path. You can see it from an optimal here. And you notice that it's quite late in the game. Um, but, uh, but it does it, and it's proving some substantial thing that a human doesn't really want to have to do. What is the... Oh, when, when do we kill it? Um, yeah, <laughs> when you get pulled. Um, so, no, no, I mean, lean has lots of... Um, I mean, we usually just let lean's default timeout kill it. Uh, I turned lean's default timeout off for this when I realized this morning that it was running extremely slowly. Uh, so this would, this would certainly have been killed by the default timeout. Uh, I, I can't tell you exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not fully exploring each vertex before it continues on to, to, to keep working. As it's exploring out from some vertex, it finds a good one to work on. It continues from there rather than... And it'll, it'll come back if it needs to. Okay. Uh, I better finish up because we're right at time. Uh, oh, yeah. And that's basically it. That's a picture of just from some other one that I had earlier in case the demo completely failed. And, uh, yeah, okay. Let's stop there. Thanks. So Oh, um, yeah, 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 so, I mean, so, uh, Lean has a built-in rewrite tactic that um, uses these abstractions that uh, does something. Um, it unfortunately wasn't good enough uh, because it has a problem when there are 
multiple ways in which a single lemma can apply on a given expression if uh, it will refuse to find more than the first one in certain, in certain circumstances. Uh, it's, it's a little complicated to specify exactly what it does, but I think it does but yeah, it's got a problem. It's intended to be fast, it's not intended to be application to find your possible insights. So we had to write some pretty gross code to do that. And we found in practice when we had a degree of library, we really needed that. We needed to be able to, it just wouldn't find the experience that we find all the So we had to do something converse. So we asked the built-in rewriter, can you rewrite this? We checked, did it rewrite the whole expression in one go? Uh, if yes, we accept that rewrite. If no, then we zoom in and try rewriting it again. And that's, that's kind of how it was being. Yeah, oh yeah, there's no confluence here whatsoever, no. I mean, proving all lots of the examples here, I'm sure you couldn't make the lemmas confluent in any way. So it was turning both sides down to some common thing. Oh, yeah, oh, okay. But I mean, I can, we can show you a bunch of examples here where it's proving A equals B and it goes up to much more complicated expression. Than it's, there's no sense in which it's... Yeah, yeah, this is one that, I mean, uh, yeah, this is set up at the moment so it fails if it doesn't complete the chain. Uh, you, you could imagine and you want to at some point um, have it just return the best pair it finds if it can't do it, but it's somehow unlikely that the best pair it finds will actually be human, meaningful to humans, so it's not a good candidate. Yeah, it could be, yeah. Yeah, we haven't, yeah, we haven't. Turned it into an interaction And the Yeah. 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 So, uh, um, I mean, the maybe something I didn't, didn't say here. They, I don't want to think of this so much as saying this is a strong competitor for the existing automation tactics that are out there. Mostly, I think the takeaway from this is everything here is written in lean. Indeed, written in lean most by, by an undergrad in the math department. Uh, so the sort of, uh, the, one thing I'll say is that, so what's this thing? Um, E-matching is I think the, the okay, is what, you, what I was originally using for many of these applications in the category theory lab, using something that a professional wrote. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but it was eventually failing uh, for two reasons. Um, well, okay. one, so sometimes it was failing for a reason that I understood that was a bug in their implementation to do with type classes and having multiple type classes over the same type, but different parameters and yada, 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 that they weren't going to fix. But there are other examples where it was just not getting there, and this one does get there. So, I mean, it, 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 uh, it has a different set of strengths and weaknesses. I mean, if the edit distance really is good heuristic, then this is great. It's not a strength. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, this is a Maybe I'm sort of a general thing to say about that is that I think this tactic sort of reflects the idea that. Um, I think there's value in um, not just implementing the computer science style automation based on decision procedures or things that exhaustively solve problems in some way, but that also writing automation that imitates the heuristics that, that humans doing calculations use. And I think, I mean, this was, the idea at least is that this is, does try and imitate a bit what humans do. I, I do prove things by like, uh, this side of the formula's got an F on it, that side's got a G, I've got to apply some limit that turns F's into G's. How do I do it?
very much. Thank you for seeing so I've heard it lean, but I haven't seen it go. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, what was that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Mm. Oh, to, okay. Oh, the, yep, the actual one. Yep. It's only used in society. Okay. Right. So the, the choice. Oh, the choice was coming in somewhere else. Oh, it came from MinFact, probably. Yeah. Yeah, um, because uh -huh. it, it's stupid that you're using MinFact there. Yeah. So, it's stupid that you're using choice to take the minimum factor. But yeah, yes. we're doing maths. <laughs> 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 well, it's good as long as it works. Right. Yeah. Yes. Well, of course it works. It's true. So why wouldn't you use it? Well, so it's true. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't mean it works in that sense. It might be true, but your uh, your computer might say no. Uh, yeah. Just accept the accent. 